Welcome to Around Space. I'm Kent Miller. Today we're going to be talking about gravitational waves. I'm delighted to have with us Dr. Bradford Baer, astronomer and optical engineer. In 1992 he got his bachelor's in astronomy from Williams College in Massachusetts. In 2000 he got his PhD in astrophysics from Caltech. From then until 2003 he worked at the McDonnell Observatory in Texas and then moved to the U.S. Naval Observatory here in Washington, D.C. In 2007, he branched off into the private sector, bringing spectroscopy down to Earth. Welcome back to this table. Thanks, Kent. It's great to be here. Recently, something historical happened. The, uh, the world of physics uh, uh, was, was all abuzz for, for many months about uh, some amazing uh, potentially amazing uh, uh, discovery that um, was coming out of the LIGO project, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And uh, in February of this year, they had a press conference to announce, indeed, they had directly detected for the very first time gravitational waves. And this is um, it's a pretty big deal for physics and astronomy. It's going to uh, land a Nobel Prize for the, the main players on that uh, huge international team of, uh, of researchers. All right. Now, there, there's some history. The idea has been around since the 60s. Oh, well, let's talk about the theory. Right. The theory is, goes back to, to Einstein and his theory of general relativity, which was published in uh, uh, 1916. 1916. So right. that's 100 years. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. uh, appropriately, on, on the <laughs> 100th anniversary of that um, uh -huh. uh, theoretical publication, um, Einstein had the, a set of equations that described the, the connection between space and time and described it at least um, qualitatively, you can think of, of space as this stretchy fabric. And um, gravity is due to the, the bending of this, of this uh, surface due to the masses, you know, large bodies in it. Uh, but like, um, like a trampoline, um, not only can there be a, a fixed uh, dimple due to a heavy mass, there can be ripples, waves that, mm -hmm. that travel. And these are very different sorts of waves than light waves or radio waves. Um, it's not electromagnetism, it's the actual fa fabric of space that is uh, rippling. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, Einstein himself thought, oh, okay, the theory says these things exist, but they're going to be so tiny that no one could ever detect them directly. Right. And for a long time, that was quite true. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, very hard to detect. Now, the um, the idea for a detector started in, in about the 60s. Right. Is that people about right? people yeah. started thinking, well, okay, if, if how could we uh, mm -hmm. pick up these these? It's sort of like uh, seismographs for space itself, not for mm -hmm. um, the the Earth shaking, but for um, the universe shaking. Right. And um, there were there were a couple of of experiments that used huge masses. Hanging from from pendulum, uh, sort of like a pendulum. So this was the Weber bar. Uh, right? I believe, yeah, the Weber was one of the the pioneers in that, and they were mm -hmm. they were trying to. They knew that these these ripples would be extremely faint, but figured if we can get something that will resonate, that will rock back and forth at the same frequency mm -hmm. as these ripples, it'll build up to an amplitude that we could we could uh, actually measure. measure. Yeah. Um, and in parallel with that, um, in the 1970s and 80s, some evidence came along that gravitational waves were in fact out there, even though this wasn't a direct detection. So there's indirect evidence because, uh, now this was, had to do with pulsars, is Correct. that right? So two, <coughs> two astronomers um, discovered a, a pulsar, uh, a, a neutron star, the collapsed core of a star mm -hmm. that was spinning rapidly, had magnetic fields, and like a lighthouse would go blink, 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 but in radio waves, not in light waves. Sure. And they watched it and realized, oh, it's not pulsing 
at the same rate. Sometimes it's pulsing a little faster, sometimes a little slower on an eight hour cycle. And that means it was an orbit around around another object, yeah. but and and pulsars um, had been found before orbiting other objects, but much more slowly. These these this this orbit was only taking eight hours to complete, which meant mm -hmm. that both objects had to be extremely small, compact uh, objects. In fact, both neutron stars. One of them was visible as a pulsar; the other was invisible, but we knew it was there because essentially the Doppler shift in the right. in the pulse rate. Right. But um, being so close together, these two objects um, were shaking uh, the, the fabric of space-time and producing ripples. Well, these ripples were never detected. I th as I understand it, the pulsar binary had been observed over many, many years, right. uh, maybe even decades. And 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 something well, happened. <laughs> and, and so, although the, they couldn't see the yeah. uh, gravitational waves being produced by this this do, -si -do they noticed that the um, rate at which the two pulsars were going around each other was very gradually speeding up. Yeah. And so they were spiraling in. They were spiraling into each other, and yeah. it's a it's a very friction free environment. There'd be no reason for them to slow down unless the system was losing energy, radiating energy away um, in the form of gravitational waves. And they tracked this, this uh, speed up this in, in spiral uh, using the very precise pulsar measurements over a period of years and found that the, the shape of the uh, drop off, or the, the, the speed up I should say, um, exactly matched the prediction for two neutron star mass objects that distance apart from each other. Okay. So this was a great vindication that Einstein's uh, theory not only was correct, but the prediction of the mm -hmm. gravitational waves uh, matched these observations very nicely. And th those two astronomers won the Nobel Prize for this, both the discovery and the correct interpretation mm -hmm. of uh, why things were slowing down. So it okay. looked like a pretty good bet. And yeah. a, a lot of the, the news stories around this more recent announcement say, oh, Einstein vindicated. Well. He was vindicated Already <laughs> uh, 40 years ago. Yeah. Everyone was pretty darn sure that gravitational waves existed, but mm -hmm. we had yet to actually measure them directly. So measuring them was going to require a tour de force in you know, technology, mainly what? Uh, you know. Essentially measuring the distance between two points on, right. on Earth's surface mm -hmm. to unimaginable precision yeah. down at the level of a thousandth or ten thousandth or even a hundred thousandth of the diameter of a proton, which is a very, very small <laughs> subatomic uh, particle. So yeah. um, the, the, the method that, that most people fixed onto as, as potentially being capable of making measurements of this precision is laser interferometry. Taking a laser beam, splitting it in two, uh, letting each half a beam or partial beam travel a, a fair distance, bounce off a mirror, and come back to their starting point, and then the two, those, those, those waves, if they travel the same distance, they'll be, still be in sync with each other. But right. if one of them, one of the arms is slightly longer than the other, they'll be out of sync, and you can right. measure this um, and determine the different uh, the changes in the lengths of those arms to a small fraction of the wavelength of light. Okay, so the the real trick is to make sure that there isn't some other disturbance, maybe like uh, somebody driving over a pothole nearby exactly. that would shake the whole laboratory. Uh, essentially, what what this uh, <laughs> yeah. big international team set down to mm -hmm. build was the world's most sensitive seismograph, and then make sure that it wasn't picking up seismic shaking, earthquakes, or right. or. Um, uh, cars driving over potholes or waves crashing on the beach, um, mm -hmm. and so the, the, the this this um, whole concept, as I said earlier, is called LIGO, the, the Laser Interferometer right. Gravity it's the name Wave of the Observatory. observatory. Name, yeah. name of the mm -hmm. of the system of observatories. There are two stations, mm -hmm. one of them in Louisiana, one in Washington State, and um, putting having having two separate detectors uh, has a couple of benefits. One is if there's a little bit of Shaking on the ground in Louisiana, you're not going to feel it in in uh, Washington State, and vice versa. Right. Uh, but also, if you do measure a, a true 
gravity wave passing through the Earth, both stations will pick it up, but because these gravity waves travel at the speed of light, there will be a slight delay as much as, I think it was 10 milliseconds, uh, if, if it hits Louisiana first and then uh, Washington State, you know it came from that direction. Southern if it, Hemisphere. It, right, if, it, yeah. if it hits uh, yeah. Washington first, then you know it comes from that direction. Right. And you can, using <clears throat> more sophisticated analysis, you can actually pin down the direction of this gravity wave source uh, uh, quite a bit more precisely than that. Yeah. All righty. Um, now, as I understand it, uh, suppressing the noise right. was was the you know that was the triumph here because the signal was going to be very faint. Exactly. Everyone understood that. And making sure that the real signal wasn't lost in the static from right. earthquakes, from um, even even the laser beam hitting the mirrors well, even is the, enough to even the shake it. Right. The, the tempered thermal effects, um, mm -hmm. just just unimaginable set of different things that could fool, either fool you into th thinking you saw a gravity wave mm -hmm. or simply not be able to see it because of, the, you know, it's like, like trying to um, listen to someone whispering in your ear in the middle of a cocktail party. All of that background noise right. uh, it, it makes it hard to, to hear the, the true signal. Yeah. I think audio tech or audiophile people would, would kind of understand this. I, I suspect that, so. Uh, the, the biggest source of noise is, is the input, that's the microphone. And uh, we do a pretty good job on the electronics nowadays, right. I think, in suppressing the noise. And then the next big source of noise is, is your speakers, right? As it were, yes. So um, there's really three technology challenges there in suppressing the noise. Right. To, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. atmospheric effects also, the, mm -hmm. these, these long tubes that the laser beam is traveling through have had nearly all of the air taken out. It's a, not quite a perfect vacuum, but pretty close. Yeah. Um, in order to uh, essentially amplify the, the, the stretching that they're trying to, to measure, each laser beam doesn't just go up and back once. It travels back and forth dozens, if not hundreds of times, so that the effective length of each of these arms is more than a thousand kilometers. And um, the, uh, when, when this project was started, uh, they, I think, realized that it was going to be a very significant engineering challenge, but that the potential payoff was, was huge and convinced the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. that it was worth funding and um, I think six or seven hundred million dollars uh, has been invested in, in the project so far. It went online in 2002, operated till 2010, didn't see a thing, which was actually as expected. They realized that this very faint signal uh, probably wasn't going to be uh, detectable in the first uh, phase of the project. Mm -hmm. But then after some upgrade, they would spend those eight years learning how to suppress the background, learning how to uh, optimize the system and then upgrade it mm -hmm. and um, improve the sensitivity, essentially being able to detect a fainter signal. Um, and at that point, they were hoping and pretty confidently sure that they'd be able to see something right. eventually. I understand the, the basic effect of what's been done is that they've increased the volume of the universe uh, or the portion of the universe that they can see exactly, uh, or detect events from. Even though these waves so. aren't the same as radio waves or mm -hmm. light waves, they follow the same rule that the further away you go, the more the energy is spread out and the fainter the signal will be. Right. So if you can hear a fainter, so if, you, if, you, if you can hear better, you, that means you can hear something the same volume that's further away. So it's basically, I understand the, the distance at which they can detect something now is with advanced LIGO is 10 times greater than the in, previous version. Yeah. And that means a, a thousand times the volume. So a thousand times the number of potential sources, exactly. sources that could, you could detect. So they, um, uh, they completed these, uh, these upgrades mm -hmm. last fall, uh, tw uh, 2015. Uh, and they actually, I believe, hadn't even started the official observing run. They were going to collect data for a period of some months and say, okay, here's the first batch of data. Let's look at it very closely and draw some conclusions about what we see or don't see. The, even, in, as is often the case in science, even non-detections teach you something. Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, you know, if, if we don't pick up any 
in spiraling or any of these neutron stars doing their little dance, that means there aren't as many of them out there as perhaps we thought they were. There were. Right. But uh, even before that official start, they were taking some engineering data, just making sure everything is well tuned. And uh, September 14th of 2015, they got a little, whoop, a little chirp, a little blip, <laughs> both at the Louisiana station and at the Washington State station. Uh -huh. And those, the, the, the waveform, the, this little squiggle, it was mm -hmm. just, just seven or eight zigzags of the, um, uh, of the distance on one of the arms. But the two stations matched each other very, very closely. Um, and what they measured also extremely closely matched with what simulation said you should get from two black holes in the final stages of their spiraling in and merging into a single black hole. Mm -hmm. right, so you now, can bet that they were all awfully excited when this, when this signal showed up and right, the computer went ding, 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 found something. As an experimenter though, uh, you always have to be cautious. And, Extremely. And in fact, the engineers had put in a, a way of injecting a phony signal as a way of testing everything out. Right. So they <laughs> D double check to make sure someone didn't press the t you know, test button by accident. Yeah. Uh, double check to make sure that that the uh, they weren't you know, accidentally putting the feed from one observatory into the other one. Yeah. And of course, double triple checking everything to to make sure that this you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Or sure very it wasn't evidence. a coincidence. Right. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it took some four or five months between the detection and the announcement because there are, even, even just in the past couple of years, there have been several uh, examples of big press conference announcement, some great new discovery in physics or astronomy or some other branch of, of science, or remember cold fusion from back in the 90s. And then, uh, wait a second, we forgot to carry the two. Yeah, so <laughs> or retraction. It, we had to retract those yeah. results that turned out not to be true. Yeah, so yeah. They, um, they wanted to, <clears throat> dot the T's and cross the I's um, mm -hmm. and make sure that, that, that this was a real signal and that it meant what they thought it did. All right, so they, they had some kind of a, uh, a theoretical model and, and by tweaking the mass of the, uh, the black holes they could get some kind of a curve that they could fit to the data. Exactly, right. And that's how they discovered how much, it, what was the total weight? So the, um, the, the, there, there are still some error bars, uncertainty on, on all these parameters, mm -hmm. but um, the um, the two black holes were both on the order of 30 times the mass of our sun, one of them a little bit heavier than the other. Mm -hmm. um, to, if I remember correctly, uh, 35 and, uh, no sorry, 36 and 29 okay. solar masses. So a total of 65. Right. You'd think a total of 65, but the, so these two things merge and then there, in, you can see that right in the squiggle there, there's what's called ring down, which is the merged black hole, which is sort of uh, oscillating like a, like a, yeah, a soap bubble, vibrating. Vi vibrating before it settles down. <laughs> yeah. And um, from the shape and, and amplitude of that vibration, they estimated or you know, were able to calculate the mass of the final black hole at 62 solar masses. So three solar masses went away. Missing, missing. No, not missing. Turned into, into energy. Okay. And the the you know, again back to Einstein equals mc squared, and you can uh, the, the the fusion nuclear fusion that drives all nor, or, uh, ordinary stars is tiny little fractions of each of those atoms getting turned into energy. Right. Well, in this case. Imagine three of our suns completely disappearing and being turned into energy in like one or two tenths of a second. It, yeah, and, yeah. The, and the, yeah, this 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 pulse, this chirp was was extremely brief. So, so it was the brightest object in the in the universe. Not bright in light, but in terms of the gravitational energy being radiated, uh, the estimates uh -huh. are that it was fifty times brighter than the entire rest of the universe put together. Oh my goodness! Just for that brief. Yeah, period of time, but tenth of a second. That yeah, tenth of yeah, a yeah. second. So, um, oh my goodness. Even though it is, according to their estimates, a billion light years away, we were still able to pick it up with the, the advanced LIGO here okay. on Earth. Now, this um, th this is really an achievement, but more importantly, it's it's a new window in the universe, and what can we do now? 
So, well, we can yeah. hopefully see many more black holes merging, mm -hmm. and a, you know, a single detection is, uh, you know, you, you don't take a political poll by just asking a single person. Of course. You're not going to get a, a very reliable answer. So LIGO it will continue to operate for months and years, and they'll mm -hmm. see, oh, we got, we got three this year, we got five the following year. The average rate of these mergers um, tells us something about how black holes form, how often they form in a binary system. Mm -hmm. the, the whole idea that, that these two black holes of about 30 uh, solar masses each, that by itself is a big deal because we've never seen black holes of that size. We've seen them somewhat smaller and much, much larger, but there was no evidence one way or another whether these intermediate, uh, I shouldn't call it an intermediate mass black hole, but these large stellar mass black holes even existed. And so the theorists now have something to hang their hat on as to can really massive stars form these much more massive mm. black holes. Indeed. Uh, so, so yeah, we've, we've essentially got a, a new type of telescope. It's buried in tubes underground, so yeah. it's, it's uh, not a traditional telescope, but it lets us see, some, see things that we'd have little to no chance of seeing with a more traditional telescope. Now, one of the problems with traditional, with, with optical telescopes, is, is there's dust in the universe. And, for example, infrared, they, they can see that dust and study it, but mm -hmm. they, it's much harder to see through it to right. uh, object. But that's not a problem for gravitational radiation. Gravity waves will, gravitational waves will travel through anything. That's part of the challenge because it makes them very hard to pick up. But yeah. if you can, it's essentially, you know, even, a, even better x-rays than x-rays because they don't get stopped or scattered. They just keep on going and going and going. Yeah. So potentially we have access to the whole universe, not with LIGO, but a, maybe a, a follow-on right. more sophisticated. And, and to that, to that mm -hmm. point, LIGO is not the only game in town. Um, it's, um, it was, uh, and it was not even the first one, but it's the, the first uh, one that successfully detected waves. But um, there are other projects using slightly different, but fundamentally the same sort of methodology to try to pick these up. There's, um, there's one in Italy. Um, it's Virgo. Virgo, I Virgo. is is okay. I forget what the acronym so stands for. A little bit for. smaller. Yep. A little okay. bit smaller, but it should still be sensitive enough to pick up these sorts of events. Good. Um, the uh, LIGO project is going to get a third installation in India. Okay. And uh, there are a couple of other smaller efforts as well, and they're all cooperating. They, so this means we can triangulate. Exactly. With if you get signals at three or more. You, you know where it came from. From, from the, both the timing and which, which arm of the interferometer uh -huh. gets longer or shorter, you can, you'll be able to, to much more precisely pin down w the direction that those waves are traveling and therefore where that object came uh, That means you can was. put out the news and the optical telescopes can go point and maybe you'll see something. Possibly. Um, yeah. And uh, I, that's, that's certainly something I'm sure they're going to try. Yeah. Uh, in case there's a little bit of a X-ray burst or optical or, or even a radio burst from this the, this event, but um, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, the in addition to just it's not just going to be sensitive to black holes, neutron stars, white dwarfs, even a single star collapsing in a supernova will send out um, a pulse uh, with a very different sort of shape than um, than these um, in spiraling black holes, right. and quite possibly. I, I, you had mentioned looking back to the the uh, the Big Bang. You know, that's the, especially the particularly the inflationary stage that happened right. split second after the Big Bang is expected to have created gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. LIGO, even advanced LIGO, won't be able to see that. But there are there's this orbiting interferometer that that's being planned. Uh, LISA. LISA. Yeah. Laser interferometer space array. Something like that. Acronyms but are always tough it's to three, keep both. It's three satellites, and they're like five million kilometers apart. So they're like exactly, that. getting yeah. a much longer baseline. In solar orbit. And, and it'll be not just orbiting Earth, but, but orbiting the sun, yeah. probably trailing Earth. Um, yeah, right. But um, that'll open up a, a yet another See section a of the window. Bigger to, volume of the universe would be right. visible. Um, and mm -hmm. um, as is often the case when you get new observational capability, we, they may discover some other sort of gravitational wave source that no one had ever imagined. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is, it's, 
it's a big deal, but it's only the very beginning of a new era. It's not that LIGO is going to close the doors and go home now that they've detected <laughs> one. This is uh, that the fun is just beginning. Yeah, and uh, and I think uh, because the noise suppressing noise suppression technology is really cutting edge. It's and uh, and it's, uh, and and it's amazing. continuing to progress. They yeah. they expect even the current upgrades will get better over the next couple of years as they add in additional bells and whistles or refine the computer algorithms that mm -hmm. that distinguish noise from from actual interesting signals. So, so this, it, this is Im implications in the engineering community. I'm sure they're going there yeah. are going to be if there haven't already been a lot of spin-offs for other situations where you want to make very precise measurements mm -hmm. without getting distracted or or yeah. uh, um, fooled by uh, background noise sources. Yeah. So um, Looks like uh, Nobel Prizes, maybe. Uh, quite, qu almost certainly. Yeah. Um, it's uh, although who gets it is is a big question. There were there were um, professors from Caltech and MIT who who were sort of the founders of this concept. But the uh, the paper that an announced this detection and then had some astronomy to say about it. You know, your typical astronomy paper is two or three people, maybe a team of ten. Uh, this paper had over a thousand co-authors. <laughs> um, yes. no, normally, normally, if your name in, and so they're all listed in alphabetical order because who oh, wants dear. to decide who made, you know, a bigger contribution than someone else? Yeah. Um, normally, if your name is, if your last name is Abbott, you're going to be listed first alphabetically. <laughs> okay. But there were three Abbots oh, on, this, <laughs> on this project, so um, oh, right. it, it was uh, quite a, quite a team effort. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for joining us here at Around Space. Uh, that was Dr. Bradford Baer, astronomer and optical engineer. See you next time.